Welcome to another episode of Laid Back History Road Trip. Unfortunately, Clay couldn't be with us today. He's feeling a little under the weather. But we got a group of guys today uh, that are going to head out with us. And we're going to be going to a French and Indian war site about two, two and a half hours from here. The site's called Fort Dewey. Now, Fort Dewey was uh, built in August of 1758 during the Forbes campaign when uh, the British were trying to oust the French from uh, Fort Duquesne, modern day Pittsburgh. Um, so we're going to go and document that site, take some photos, uh, take some videos, and interview a couple of people. Um, so I hope you guys enjoy this episode, and um, come along today, and let's uh, enjoy this episode of Laid Back History. We're at Mount Eret at the Allegheny Mountains. And this is a set of mountains between the Bedford and Somerset County line that General Henry Bouquet, in a letter to John Forbes, refers to this mountain as that terrible mountain. On August 20th, 1758, Henry Bouquet wrote to General John Forbes, I went yesterday to reconnoiter that terrible mountain and found a road where a six horse carriage could be taken without difficulty. The gap has improved and I've seen 20 loaded wagons go up there without doubling by climbing to the second hill, which requires no effort. I could see as far as sight could reach and saw distinctly the whole course of the hill. Sir Alan McLean was a captain in the 77th Regiment known as the Montgomery Highlanders. He was also in charge of the construction of Fort Dewart, which he named after Dewart Castle, the ancestral home of Clan McLean and its chiefs which is located in the Isle of Mole in Scotland. It has been in the possession of the McLean since at least 1367. Fort Dewar is a part of this Forbes campaign, of course. So you're going to have a large army that is going to be going along what we know as the Forbes Road. And as they go, they're going to be building uh, forts and redoubts, uh, earthenworks, and so on and so forth. Uh, and Fort Dewar was actually at the uh, really at the top of Roar's Gap, which was a really a difficult ascent to get over the mountains to really between Bedford and Fort Ligonier. And it was an earthen, uh, earthen construction, essentially. And really it was, so once you got up Roar's Gap, you'd have a place that you could stop, you know, rest your soldiers, rest your horses, and then continue uh, to move then down the mountain, continue along the Forks Road. Um, but really, that, that fortification constructed by uh, some of the Highlanders there was really important along this string of fortifications because as General Forbes and his massive army are moving along, they need to protect themselves. Um, so by having places like Fort Ligonier, but even smaller places like Fort Dewart, uh, other redoubts along the way, they're actually able to protect their army. As they so we're here near the top of Allegheny Mountain. We're about ready to take about a mile trek up to the site of Fort Dewar. Now, before we get started, I wanted to give you a little bit of specs about Fort Dewar. Fort Dewar was roughly a 60 by 60 readout, an earth and solid readout. Um, and it's noted that General Forbes himself stayed here for about five days between August 24th and August 29th of 1758. And the reason why he stayed here for five days is the roads were impassable. They were very muddy. I guess there was a very large rainstorm that came through. So I am actually walking on the trace of the old Forbes Road on top of Allegheny Mountain. You can see all the ferns and how the, um, the trees aren't as big as they used to be, probably because of all the uh, timbering they've done over the centuries. But it's um, pretty neat to be actually walking on the Forbes Road itself. So I'm walking on the old trace of the Forbes Road. And about 200 to 300 yards in front of me is the site of Miller's Tavern, 
and Fort Dewart. And we're going to be meeting up with Ron Sin, who is uh, the caretaker of the site, and hopefully we'll get some good information from him. Hi, I'm Terry Doran, along with uh, Ron Sane. Uh, we're members of the Fulmont Property Owners Association, which maintains and preserves uh, Fort Dewart. Uh, Fort Dewart is the last remaining earthen redoubt from the French and Indian War, uh, and the second longest surviving uh, military uh, okay. uh, yeah, military fort from the French and Indian War. So. Uh, it is absolutely amazing that uh, Fort Dewar continues to exist. Over the years and in, in the early, the late 1890s, this entire area here was logged. Uh, there is a logging camp um, at the very entrance of uh, Fulmont down on uh, Route 30. It used to be called McNeil Town, so they logged this entire mountain. And for some reason, none of this area, the area that is Fort Dewart, was ever disturbed. So the fact that it's actually here is amazing. Uh, after that, um, a group called the Wilderness Club took over this area, maintained the fort, um, and it continued to exist until the Fulmont Property Owners Association came into existence in 1995, at which time this was established as a um, park for the association. So over the years, uh, Mr. Sane and others um, have maintained and continue to maintain this fort uh, according to the standards of, uh, of historical society. So everything that was done here was done according to uh, the standard way of doing it. Um, later on, um, as part of the, an effort to place the Fort Dewart on the National, National Register of Historic Places, uh, we held several fundraisers. Uh, from uh, chicken sales to uh, a gathering of the McLean clan from Scotland, actually the McLean clan international, um, headed by uh, Sir Lachlan McLean from the, the Isle of Mall in Scotland. And a group of 300 uh, McLean clansmen uh, came to Fort Dewar to rededicate the fort uh, to their ancestor who had built and engineered uh, part of the Forbes Road as well as the fort itself. And there's a plaque to our right, which uh, designates um, the McLean clan as rededicating their fort um, to their ancestor who had built it. Uh, the association also established some storyboards here uh, so that people can understand the tremendous amount of work it took to even get to Fort Dewart, which means you had to go up the side of the mountain off Roars Gap um, and a huge, amazing undertaking. Uh, that is often referred to as kind of like the climb of death. Uh, it was a huge climb up a hill um, in uh, Fort Pitt Museum. There's a painting by Nat Youngblood, uh, which mentions that they were hauling 10 pound cannons with 20 pair of oxen up the side of that mountain. So if you ever visit this area, you have to visit Roars Gap, go down Route 30 and there's a big curve there. You'll see Roars Gap there and then you can look to the left and imagine uh, groups of uh, Scottish soldiers, British soldiers, uh, marching up the side of that mountain and uh, trying to clear a path which eventually became Forbes Road in the, in the Alleghenies here. Um, part of the reason this fort exists today is uh, the fact that in the 1930s, as part of uh, the uh, Depression era initiative to restore and maintain historical areas, they established monuments along the Forbes Road. Uh, you can see them on Route 30, and there is one, an obelisk right to my left there, that was put up in 1932, I believe, uh, as part of that. In the 1960s, there was a, a historical dig done here um, where they removed many artifacts, but uh, the problem with that particular dig was that they didn't uh, do a very good job of, of maintaining records of what they actually did and when they actually dug out and it is made, and some of those artifacts are lost and some of them are in private hands today, as well as in Fort Ligonier in, in uh, Ligonier, Pennsylvania. Uh, so as of today, uh, Fort Dewart is on the National Register of Historic Places. After about an eight year um, effort to place it there uh, and in um, a week or two, uh, we're going to have a, an unveiling ceremony where we place the plaque 
and uh, show the public the, the uh, plaque that was uh, will be placed here, rendering this as a uh, on the National Register. And the important thing is that the association is committed to maintaining uh, Fort Duart and has done so in the past and will continue to do so in the future. Uh, much to the work of Ron Sane and, and uh, many others that are part of the association. So uh, we welcome you here. This is really kind of an exciting place just to visit. You can almost feel history here because where we stand many, many years ago, S Scotsmen from uh, the Isle of Mall stood. And I can only imagine what it was like to march from Philadelphia all the way out uh, what is now Route 30 and then finally up the side of the mountain here and try to traverse the Allegheny Mountains as a way to conquer Fort Duquesne. Uh, pretty amazing feat uh, done by people who had never seen North America and um, if you read about North America at this time these woods w were or not occupied but they were filled with trees that uh, were immense, immense hemlock forests which eventually were logged, but you can only imagine how dark and foreboding it must have been here uh, at Fort Duet. So we welcome you here and, uh, and uh, thank you for your interest in the fort. Yeah, as Terry mentioned <clears throat> years ago, the reason why this area looks like it is now, there were several individuals that lived in Fallmont. One was Peter Fullen. Um, about 18 years ago, when my wife and I moved in Fulmont, got to know him, and he said, uh, would you like to assist me on Fort Door? Now he had no idea what Fort Door was. And I said, yeah, we'll see what can, I'll give you a hand. I met him up here, and he says, this area here, what we want to do, and at that time, there was a lot of ferns, very little grass, there were shrubs, there was trees in the area. He said, we're in the, in, the, in the making of cutting all the trees in, within the area down and cutting the shrubs and getting out the other foliage. So I said, yeah, I'll join. And I was the first one introduced in his, what he called his one-man army. Prior to that, Peter had come up by himself. Then I got drafted. And I worked, Pete and I worked together for many, many years getting the area cleaned up. And he happened to move away to another area. Now, I am the one-man army, and I've been trying to draft people to give a hand here. And one another reason why it looks pretty good as far as maintenance, as I was telling uh, Gary. <laughs> Gary, yeah, just on the east side of the burr there, when they came out and they did a survey, uh, metal detectors and all that, they did this, like Terry mentioned, years a couple of years ago. We happened to find a barbed wire fence that was buried in the ground, maybe by the foot. So I don't know if someone had foresight or hindsight or whatever, if they wanted to keep this area or was just a fruit of luck that they happened to put a fence around this. So I'm thinking on the later term what they knew about this and they, they fenced it off. So, and they, like I said, there was a lot of work done from a lot of individuals in Fulmont. There was a lot of big trees through the area. I have pictures uh, in the 1940s at my house, which shows people wandering about, and we have trees right where you see where the grass is. And they came up, and uh, we had we had another individual, Dave Berkey, this was in Fulmont. Uh, him and his crew came out years ago, and they cut a lot of trees down and cut them up. So there, there's been a lot of effort, and there's nothing. We're, we're, all we're trying to do is maintain it to restore it, not, not to restore it what it looked like years ago, because you can't, but just to maintain of what you see here, the Florida mounds and that dugout area. So, and, and also, since this area is back here, what we do is we bring in push mowers, lawn mowers to cut this, because, you know, people think, well, why don't you bring a big piece of equipment out here? Well, if you did that, you would be tearing up the mound and stuff. So it's, it's pains, you know, painstaking. It, it would take two people at least two hours to cut it and weed whack it. And that's what we wanted to keep this. We don't want to, you know, to tear it up. And we never had a problem as far as people coming out here and trespassing. A lot of people respect the area, especially the ones in Fulmont know about it. 
1930, the Pennsylvania Historical Commission, the predecessor of the PHMC, erected a seven-foot-tall granite monument at the center of the fort. The 77th Regiment, or as you said, Montgomery's Highlanders, is raised by Archibald, or excuse me, are raised by Archibald Montgomery, um, who is going to put together this group of Highlanders uh, that are going to end up really at the beginning of this campaign about being over a thousand strong uh, that are going to be involved with General Forbes. Now keep in mind also those Highlanders that are going to be from Scotland. Uh, General Forbes himself is from Scotland as well. Um, so these Highlanders are going to make up a, you know, a royal regiment of Forbes' army. Um, as they go along, they're going to be bringing along with them the, the typical garb that you think of Highlanders. They have their kilts on, they have their, their long swords, or basketball broadswords, excuse me, that they're going to bring along. Um, but they're very crucial to this army. Uh, they're going to make up, like I said, a part of it, as well as you're going to have other royal regiments, you're going to have provincial regiments that are going to be involved. But with those Highlanders, you're also going to have some, besides Archibald Montgomery, of course, some other uh, big figures for the French Indian War, uh, James Grant, who's going to suffer a, uh, a defeat that was pretty important, uh, called Grant's defeat. But the Highlanders are a formidable fighting force, and as they go along, along the Forbes Road, helping to construct it, um, building some of these redoubts as they move along, they're going to be crucial to taking Fort Duquesne. Let's talk a little bit more about Sir Alan McLean and the three companies of Highlanders. They weren't too fond of the British, but times were tough, and the British provided a wage. And in the British Army, Scottish dress laws didn't apply. They could wear their kilts and broadswords and dirks, and they could use their bagpipes. I mention this because these things became outlawed after the 1745 Battle of Culloden, which was part of the Jacobite rebellion over the British monarchy.